We are privileged to welcome Professor Tamada. He's a professor of Kyoto University. And um, after having the practical side of the arbitrations uh, in the morning, we will go into the more substantive uh, aspects of international arbitration, especially uh, investor state disputes. And today he will give us a lecture on the theme of ISDS and international investment law, especially focusing on the current um, updates and development of the investment disputes arising from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, now please join me in welcoming Professor Tamada. <laughs> Professor Tamada, the floor is yours. Hello everyone, good afternoon. I'm Dai Tamada from Kyoto University. And today I'm going to talk about ISDS and International Investment Law. This is uh, the main title. And the subtitle is War in Ukraine and International Investment Law. <clears throat> Uh, probably I'm going to publish this paper this, uh, based on this lecture you know, ne next year in the journal, International Community Law Journal, a Community Law or Review, sorry, uh, next year, uh, hopefully. So, <clears throat> this is outline. After the intro introduction, I'm going to talk about Ukrainian investors versus Russia, foreign investors versus Russia, uh, foreign investors versus Ukraine, and uh, uh, Russian investors versus uh, Western states. A little situation is a little bit complicated. I'm going to explain a little bit later before conclusion. Okay, section one, <coughs> concerning introduction. A number of investment disputes have arisen from Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022 in four categories. Uh, sorry. Okay, first one. Disputes between Ukrainian investors and Russia directly arising from Russia's invasion since 2022 and the annexation of Crimea in 2014. Okay. So this is Ukrainian investors versus Russia. And two, number two, uh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, to the first category of dispute, we are going to discuss the applicability of uh, the Russian, Ukrainian, uh, BIT, Bilateral Investment Treaty, right? And number two, dispute arising from Russia's measures to prevent foreign investors from withdrawing from Russian business. Okay, this is the second category. That is foreign investors versus Russia, uh, including Japanese uh, companies, investors, and to which we are going to apply, for example, Japan, Russia, BIT, right? And third one is disputes arising from measures taken by Ukraine okay, against Russian investments. So this is foreign investors versus Ukraine, the third category, to which, for example, Russia, Ukraine, BIT will be applied. And the last one, fourth one, uh, disputes which may arise from the measures of Western countries to freeze the assets of Russian nationals and organizations. So this is uh, Russian investors versus Western states, including Japan, and probably your countries. I don't know, sorry, I'm not sure about that. So <clears throat> to the, the first dispute, uh, we are going to discuss the applicability of the Japan-Russia BIT. Okay, it is necessary to analyze these disputes in light of each applicable BIT, Bilateral Investment Treaty, and then discuss the relevant legal issues, such as effective control of territory, the balance between sanction and energy security, and the legal status of the central bank, okay, central bank of Russia, for example, under the BIT. Okay, this is the outline and the introduction of this lecture. And probably it's not necessary to explain the detail about the battlefield of the today's situation of Ukraine. Okay? The left side explained the areas of Russian military control in Ukraine. Okay? Please remember the situation because we are going to talk about effective control okay, in the term of territory. Where is the territory of Russia? 
where is the territory of Ukraine in terms of BIT. As you can see here, Crimea, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Donetsk and Luhansk. Okay? The, the last two regions are called Donbass, Donbass regions. And in addition to that, we are going to study something about nuclear power plant in Zaporizhia, so-called Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, okay, in terms of the nationalization by uh, Russia. Okay, section two, uh, about Ukraine investors versus Russia. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has been causing a gigantic scale of damage to the investment of Ukrainian investors who will attempt to recover them through investment arbitration under the Russia-Ukraine BIT. As an example, only just one example, Mr. Akhmetov, a Ukrainian businessman had interest in many industrial sectors in Ukraine. For example, metals, mining, energy, media, telecommunications, agriculture, transportation, logistics, etc., etc. The huge areas of, uh, in the Ukraine industry, because through SCM is a company's name, Ukraine, Ukraine's largest investment group. So the property, is, the, the property is concentrated on this person, businessman. And it, it is reported to, that he, is considers, uh, he, he considers referring the dispute to investment arbitration by alleging losses of 4.6 billion US dollars due to Russia's invasion. Okay? This might be the first case to be submitted to the investment arbitration from Ukrainian investors against Russian government, right? Not yet, not yet, but probably we are going to see one case. Okay, then 2.1, investment arbitration cases arising from Crimea. Again, not Donbas, not yet Donbas, but from Crimea. There have been 10 cases arising from Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014 which will bring significant implications to future cases against Russia in terms of its invasion since 2022. Okay? We are going to concentrate on the Crimea disputes because Donbass disputes, as I said, which will occur in the near future. Okay? So as you can see here, 10 cases uh, raised by claimant Ukrainian investors, Aeroport, Berbeg, Private bank, etc., etc. Just a representative claimants, because actually there are lot, much more investors claimants. But normally we abbreviate the case name by representative claimant, right? So Berbeck versus Russian government started from 2015, because after just after the 2014 annexation of Crimea, from next year, arbitration started. 15, 15, 15, and 16, and 18, 19. Probably we are going to have more and more cases uh, from Ukrainian investors against Russia. And the point is that Russia had a was firstly absent, absent, and from this case, Russia decided to appear before the arbitral proceedings. Right? And absent, 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 and the recent cases uh, turned its, up, its attitude to us uh, the present, to be present before arbitrary tribunals. I'm going to analyze this attitude of Russia, how to evaluate this attitude. And as you can see here, subject matter and decisions are disclosed here. Published decisions are underlined here. Okay, a little bit complicated. So let's see first with the, the subject. Basically, expropriation is the matter before the arbitrary tribunal. First one is, for example, expropriation of the airport management right. Okay, second one is prohibition of bank business and expropriation, and real estate expropriation, oil reservoir expropriation. The same topic, real estate expropriation, and bank branch expropriation, oil, gas, electricity expropriation. Right? A lot of cases arose from expropriation by Russia. Okay. It's, it seems a taking or nationalization of property. 
a lot of other properties have been expropriated by Russia. And as you can see here, already arbitral hours, arbitral tribunals has, have rendered partial hours. Partial hours means jurisdictional, okay? saying, saying that, okay, arbitral tribunals have jurisdiction. Okay? This is a partial award. And finally, uh, award on responsibility, okay? uh, state, res state responsibility of Russia to pay some, some amount of compensation to Ukrainian investors. And afterwards, international level stopped here, and afterwards investors have to try the, the execution judgment in third countries, like Hague Appeal Court judgment okay, in the Netherlands. The fighting is still now continuing in the third countries, domestic level. Okay. This is a structure. And the same structure, partial award, responsibility award, and domestic court judgment. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit later, Many cases are basically confidential. Everything is not disclosed. So the third, in, the, in the case of such third case, real estate expropriation, subject matter, <laughs> only subject matter is disclosed, but the details, other details is unknown because it's not disclosed, it's secret, all right? So as you can see here, many other cases as well, jurisdiction award, Merits our jurisdiction, our merits our and domestic court judgment have been rendered. Right? So we are now seeing the ongoing cases between Ukrainian investors and the government of Russia. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so with regard to the crime, uh, Crimea cases, these cases have clarified the following points. First, all cases are covered by the Russia-Ukraine BIT and the Unstral arbitral, uh, Arbitration Rules of 1976. So consequently, awards are not made public in principle, and in several cases, the tribunals have found a breach of BIT obligations by Russia and further determined the amount of compensation although no case has resulted in the payment of compensation of Russia. So there is a problem of execution, how to execute the arbitral award in domestic level. So later on, I'm going to explain. And second, arbitral awards share the same conclusion, probably through the cross references among tribunals. A little bit of detailed information, but for example, some cases are dealt with by different tribunals in parallel. For example, I'm going back to this chart, uh, Berbeck versus Russia and private bank versus Russia, this first case and the second case. Okay, if you see these two cases carefully, two cases are dealt with by different tribunals but composed by the same arbitrators and the two tribunals rendered two hours on the same day. Okay, different cases, but as you can see here, partial award rendered on the same day and the award on responsibility on the same day. <laughs> and very curiously, the Hague Appeal Court rendered a judgment, two judgments on the same day, right? So the, in parallel, two cases are dealt with in parallel. Okay, and fourth, uh, tribunals, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, third one, with regard to the geographical requirement of investment, namely territory, tribunals in common avoid definitely responding to the issue of territorial sovereignty of Crimea. We are going to discuss later. The fourth, tribunals have not examined the justification or claims of except, exceptions on the, on the part of uh, Russia. Okay. And fifth, in the initial cases, Russia was absent from the arbitration proceedings, allegedly fearing the possible finding on the legal status of Crimea under international law. But subsequently, this concern was mitigated and then Russia began to commit itself to the arbitral proceedings. At the moment, Russia does not completely neglect the investment arbitration, but rather is presenting its legal views, justifying its position through the arbitral proceedings. So as to future cases arising from Donbass, Kherson and Zaporizhia, there will be possibilities that Russia attends the arbitral proceedings, just a possibility. OK, 
Okay, then the, the most important and the most controversial issue <coughs> before the arbitrary tribunals, 10 cases, okay, ar arising from 10 cases. The term territory under BIT, right? A controversial legal issue is the legal status of Crimea and Donbass afterwards, okay, in the future cases. Why? Because Article 1, Paragraph, paragraph 1 of the Russia-Ukraine BIT provides that, I quote, investment shall denote all kinds of property and intellectual values which are put in by the investor of one contracting party, in this case Ukraine, okay, Ukraine investors, on the territory of the other contracting party, that is Russia, right? In conformity with the latter's legislation. It's a very, very short sentence, but implication is very, very important. For Ukrainian properties in Crimea to fall into the definition of investment under the BIT, they must exist on the territory of Russia. All right? For the moment, all right? So in this sense, the legal status of the location of the property under the military occupation of Russia is a preliminary and essential issue before tribunals. On this issue, scholars, for example, oh, I picked up the opinion by Patrick Danbury here. Uh, scholars have taken the position that Crimea is still part of Ukraine under international law, and therefore the arbitral tribunals must deny their jurisdiction. Okay. Furthermore, they argue that Russia's annexation of Crimea was a breach of use Kogan's peremptory norm and international law, and therefore tribunals are obliged not to recognize the consequence of that breach of use Kogan's, right? And then, against this position, however, the tribunals have admitted their jurisdiction for the following reasons, okay? Could you understand how controversial it is to discuss the legal status of Crimea? So probably many other scholars can follow the same position of that of, that of Patrick Dunbar. It's not exceptional from the scholar's viewpoint. No, no, no. Crimea is territory of Ukraine. Okay. Probably in your country's official position will be the same. I hope. Right. So what's the position? What's the explanation given by the arbitrary tribunals? How to overcome this hurdle? Right. Criteria of territory. On this issue, the Privat Bank versus Russia Tribunal stated that the effective de facto control, namely the mere presence of Russian troops in Crimea, does not satisfy the territory requirement under Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the BIT. Then it clarifies the applicable criteria of territory as follows, I quote, the critical consideration is likely to be an appreciation of settled long-term control <coughs> over the territory in question by the state. Evidence of such settled long-term control may come into area, as in this case, both from legal steps taken by the state to formalize and constitu constitutionalize its control and by settled long-term physical, manif physical manifestations of control. Okay, I think it's a long sentence, sorry. So it is made clear that the notion of settled long-term control is the essence of the territory and the BIT, which is constituted by two elements, legal elements and physical elements. Okay, two elements must be satisfied. The tribunal justifies the application of these severe criteria by emphasizing the settled nature of investment. If you have studied something about the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights, normally human rights applied very, very so soft, light criteria to apply the extraterritorial application, territorial application, on the basis of only the de facto control, without any legal, legal element. 
But in this case, two elements, legal and physical elements, both must be satisfied. Because investment must be settled in every case. Okay? Then applying these criteria, the tribunal concluded that on 21st March 2014, the date on which the incorporation law was enacted by the Parliament of Russia, the annexation date of Crimea, Crimea was to be treated for purposes of the application of VIT as part of the territory of Russia. Okay? Completely different from the public international perspective. Crimea was territory. Okay? But at the same time, please pay attention to the sentence. For the purposes, for purposes of the application of the VIT, okay, we have to separate two things. VIT is interpretation and application. And public international law, de jure sovereignty. Right? We are going to discuss later. And later, in a similar way, the Stabil versus Russia tribunal concluded that Crimea was a territory of Russia for the purpose of the BIT by stating that, I quote, there can be no doubt that the Russian Federation has established effective control over Crimea by taking physical control coupled with legal steps. It is equally clear that the respondent considers Crimea as part of its sovereign territory. It treated it, treat it as such in its national law and claims sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the international community. <clears throat> uh, of course. And uh, in the structure of reasoning, physical control and legal steps by Russia amount to effective control, uh, which satisfies the territory requirement under the BIT. Then the tribunal paid attention to the treaty interpretation rules and concluded that, okay, and uh, again, I, I quote, the ordinary meaning of the term territory includes areas over which the contracting parties exercise jurisdiction and de facto control, even if they hold no lawful title under international law. Okay? Explanation becomes a little bit more detailed than the former case. If jurisdiction in this context can be understood as legal steps, the two criteria, jurisdiction and de facto control, correspond to those mentioned in the former case, private, ba private bank versus Russia. So it can be concluded that the tribunal require two elements, namely the legal element and the physical element for satisfying the territory requirement on the Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the BIT. Okay, from two cases, we can conclude like that. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to the Donbass region, okay, future cases will continuously relate to the Crimea. Crimea cases will ar arise in the near future, but we have to discuss, we have to start discussing the Donbass, okay, Kherson, Zaporizhia, right? So if the tribunal, tribunals were to apply this criteria, legal element and physical element, to Donbass, there will be following issues. First, even though two republics declared independence in 2014, so Luhansk and Donetsk republics, the Donbas region was not militarily occupied by Russia until 2022, last year. This means that there was no effective de facto control by Russia okay, in terms of physical element. The second, since February 2022, 20, uh, there have been a lot of missile attacks, unfortunately, from Russia on Ukrainian cities, including Kyiv. However, they do not satisfy both two criteria of territory, no legal element, no physical element, unfortunately. Okay. Third, since 24th February 2022, Russia commenced to militarily occupy East Ukraine, Luhansk and Donetsk, and South Ukraine as well, Kherson and Zaporizhia. And although this fact may satisfy the criterion of effective de facto control, namely the physical element, another criteria, the legal element, was not yet satisfied. Okay? 
legal element must be uh, satisfied as well. As Russia incorporated the four regions, Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson, Zaporizhia, in October 2022, not 2022 uh, February, but later, October 2022, by its law, the two criteria have been satisfied since this moment. Okay? From this time on, we can talk about the, the applicability of territory requirement, which can be satisfied from that date. Okay? Before that date, it's quite difficult to satisfy the legal element of the territory. Okay? And then, please remember that the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is a very big issue. Right. As an actual case, there has been a dispute arising from Russia's nationalization of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Probably you have already saw the picture of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Six reactors uh, established very, very closely each other. It's quite a dangerous situation from the Japanese viewpoint. We know the Fukushima Daiichi. But apart from that, the Polish nuclear power plant, that is the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe, owned and managed by Energo Atom, a Ukrainian national nuclear energy generating company. So by the presidential order of 5th October 2022, Russia established a state-owned company to control this power plant and decided to transfer the plant property to this new company. Right? So almost indirect expropriation. In this case, it is reported that the Energo Atom sent a notice of arbitration to Russia on the basis of the Russian Ukraine BIT, and claiming three billion US dollars in damages. Right? There will be an issue as to whether the territory requirement is satisfied or not, as we already studied much. Right? First three. As Zaporizhia was already incorporated in Russia, the first element, the legal element, will be satisfied. And second, as the power plant itself has been under the control of Russia's troops since March 2022, it's the early stage of the war. Okay. Zaporizhia nuclear power plant was occupied in that area including nuclear power plant itself, was occupied by Russian troops. So uh, the second element will also be satisfied. Thus, the tribunal will find that the place of the plant in Zaporizhia can be understood as the territory of Russia in the sense of the BIT, and that Russia's nationalization without any compensation was an unlawful expropriation. This is actual case. And in addition to the territory requirement, Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the BIT also requires that for protecting Ukrainian investors' investments, they be established in conformity with Russia's legislation. Second hurdle okay, to be overcome. Please remember, we are not discussing the same article, Article 1, Paragraph 1 on the territory of Russia and in conformity with the latter's, Russia's legislation. Right. It's a very difficult question for investors. Okay. There have been two approaches with regard to the critical date for applying this requirement. According to the first approach, uh, the critical date is the initial time of establishing investments, and as they were all established under Ukrainian uh, legislation, at the initial moment, they cannot satisfy that requirement. It's very natural interpretation and application. Right? The second approach argues that the critical date is the time of initiating the arbitral procedure or the time of the alleged breach of BIT, a bit later and that investment already under the effective de facto control of Russia can satisfy the requirement. Right? Two approaches, different. In NAFTA gas versus Russia in 2019, arbitrators were divided into two sides. The majority, two arbitrators, 
took the second approach to conclude that the investment in question were established in conformity with Russia's legislation at the date of the alleged breach of BIT. On the other hand, one arbitrator, the minority, took the first approach to conclude that at the initial time, the investment were established in conformity with Russia's legislation, but with, uh, was not established uh, in conformity with Russia's legislation, but with Ukraine's, Ukraine's legislation to deny the jurisdiction. Right? And in further cases arising from Donbass, the tribunals will continue adopting the second approach to affirm their jurisdiction to be discussed later, okay? So moving on to the substantive aspect of the BIT. The Russia-Ukraine BIT provides several substantive obligations which will be in question in future cases. So as you can see there, complete and unconditional legal protection, Article 2, Paragraph 2, NT, national treatment, and MFN, most uh, favored nation treatment under, three, under Article 3, expropriation under Article 5, Paragraph 1, and the free transfer of property under Article 7. And it should be noted that in Stabil versus Russia in 2019 award, the tribunal rather succinctly concluded an unlawful expropriation by Russia under Article 5, while it omitted all other findings on other claims, okay, including FAT, NT, et cetera, et cetera. No need to touch upon that other aspect after the tribunal is concentrated only on the expropriation claims. In light of the scale and nature of Russia's measures, the tribunals in many cases will easily conclude breaches of obligation under BIT, in particular, unlawful expropriation. And then, so moving back to dispute settlement procedure under the uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine BIT, it, which it provides two means of dispute settlement, investor state and state to state. As to the former, disputing parties first shall exert their, their best efforts to settle that dispute by way of negotiation. As you might know clearly, it's not effective. Okay? And if it failed, the investor can resort to ABC, A is competent court of Russia, which is also ineffective. Okay. B, Arbitration Institute of the Chamber of Commerce in Stockholm, SCC, or C, uh, Ad Hoc Arbitration Tribunal under the Arbitration Regulation of the UNSTRO, okay, under BIT Article 9, Paragraph 2. As the first choice will be ineffective in protecting Ukraine investments, investors will attempt to choose a second or third option. So as was the case relating to Crimea, the Donbass cases will be submitted to the third option, the so unstral arbitration. So even in this option, the arbitral awards in favor of the investor claimant will face an execution problem, how to execute the arbitral award against Russia. Okay. Investors will need to request the recognition and enforcement of awards in third countries such as the United States but on this point, later on, we are going to discuss in terms of, in relation to Japan, Russia, and BIT, we are going to have the very similar questions of execution. And second, there is also the state-to-state -state dispute settlement procedure under Article 10, in case of inactivity of investment, investor state arbitration, or in parallel with it, there remains a possibility for Ukraine to use the state-to-state -state procedure. And then, <clears throat> the last point is about security exception and the law of armed conflict. As the Russia-Ukraine BIT does not contain any provision for security exception, first of all, question is whether we can apply BIT to the war. There's war, okay? armed conflict. Quite completely separate question of investment. Investment protection is basically in the peaceful time, okay? So we have to discuss this topic. How should we think about security exception? So it is not clear whether and how it can be applied in times of war or armed conflict. So with this regard, Article 6 of the BIT, okay, Russia and Korean BIT, 
mentions most favored nation treatment in the case of damage as a result of war, civil disturbances, or other similar circumstances. Okay? This means that the BIT is supposed to be applicable, basically, even in times of war. Okay? Just mention that in the, in the MFN. But basically, it's applicable in the case of war. However, considering the low level of protection of investment under Article 7, so namely, only damages in the case of war on the basis of MFN, so it is not certain whether the full reparation principle based on the HAL formula, very famous uh, formula, must be applied to the investment damage caused by the armed activities of Russia. Okay, this is discussion open to the future cases. Okay, this is the end of the first part, and uh, sorry, sorry, uh, section uh, two, and we are going to move on to uh, section three, foreign investors versus Russia. Since the invasion of Russia's, uh, sorry, sorry, since the initiation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, a lot of foreign investors, mainly of United States, Europe, and Japan, have decided to withdraw from Russia. Against this tendency, Russia attempted to prevent such a sudden and widespread withdrawal of foreign investors, and for this purpose, has taken a variety of measures. Okay? So from here, there will be dispute between foreign investors and against Russian government. Right? The first example is the external administration bill. On 12 April 2022, the External Arbitration Bill, so-called Expropriation Bill, was presented to the Russian Parliament, Duma. It provides that if an enterprise of the essential industrial sectors, whose share, more than 25%, is owned by enterprises of unfriendly states, designated by the Russian government, including Japan and uh, I'm not sure, but for your country, your own countries might be included. I'm not sure. Basically, Western countries, right? Uh, if th that enterprise withdraws from Russian business, an external administrator will be appointed to initiate the procedure of restructuring or bankruptcy, through which it may be sold to another enterprise or to the Rus Russian Federation, the government of Russia, with low price. So it seems that this bill has the purpose of preventing foreign investors from withdrawing from Russian business, and in the case of withdrawal, facilitating the transformation of the enterprise organization. So once enacted, however, the act will allow direct expropriation and will provoke investment distributes to be submitted to arbitration. In the first case. And the second one is Sahalin 2, our Russian energy project Sahalin 2, was managed by Sahalin Energy Investment Company Limited of Bermuda, and its shares, I'm not sure whether it's correct to say shares or not, but shares were owned by Gazprom, Russia 50% plus one, Shell, UK and the Netherlands 27.5% minus one, and Mitsui, the Japanese one, and Mitsubishi, also Japanese. In February 2022, Shell expressed its intention to withdraw from Sahalin II. By present, presidential order number 416 of 30 June 2022, Russia established a Russian limited liability company, so-called Sahalin Energy LLG, which will take over, okay, take over to transfer the rights and obligations of Sahalin Energy Investment Company. So by this order, the above mentioned companies, the four companies, were required to request the Russian government to permit the continuation of shareholding. Okay. The request of the two Japanese companies were finally approved by Russia, and therefore there seems to be there seems to have seems to have been no investment dispute on a superficial level. I, I am not sure whether there is still a substantial dispute between the parties. Okay, this is Sahalin 2 case. And Sahalin 1, very similar uh, consequence as that of Sahalin 2. Okay, with respect to another oil and gas project, Sahalin 1, 
its shares were owned by ExxonMobil, US, uh, US and uh, 30%, and Sodeco uh, from Japan, 30%. And Sodeco the share, Sodeco means Saharan Oil and Gas Development Corporation Limited, and uh, its shares were mainly owned by METI, the Ministry of Economy and Trade, Economy, Trade and Industry, and Itochu, JPEX, and Marubeni, among others. So it's a Japanese consortium. And uh, Sodeco Japan, uh, 30%, and uh, Los Nefuchi uh, of Russia, 20%, and ONGC, India, 20%. On uh, 1st March 2022, ExxonMobil expressed its intention to withdraw from this project, Saharan One. And against this backdrop, the Presidential Decree Number no. 520, uh, 5th August 2022, Russia pro uh, prohibited foreign investors of unfriendly states, okay, once again, in the financial, fuel, and energy sectors from conducting any transaction or operation under several conditions. The Sahalin 1 project was included in the target of the decree, as I said, under Article 2, Paragraph C. As a result, ExxonMobil was barred from selling any share, and it is reported to initiate an investment arbitration against Russia, so ExxonMobil versus Russia. As the BIT is not yet entered into force between the United States and Russia, there is no other means than a contract-based arbitration, but unfortunately. In addition to the above-mentioned measure by Presidential Decree No. 723 of 7th October 2022, Russia established a new company and transferred the business of Sahalin 1 to that new company in the same way as Sahalin uh, 2. Okay, first we have, we have discussed Saharin 2 and now Saharin 1, okay. the same way in both cases. And uh, uh, Japanese government and the Japanese companies aimed, aimed to continue the Saharin 1 business, and as was the case of the Saharin 2, they were permitted by Russian government to do so. Okay, on the basis of the factual background, I'm going to move on to the Japan-Russia BIT. When Japanese investors suffered damage from the measures taken by Russia, the investment arbitration under the Japan-Russian BIT will be a means for recovering it. And this BIT contains substantive clauses not different from normal BITs, relating to definition of investments, Article 1, MFN, Article 731, national treatment and the fair and equitable treatment, expropriation, and freedom uh, transfer, Article 8. So with regard to uh, investment dispute settlement as well, Article uh, 11, paragraph 2 of the BIT provides three options. First one is exceed arbitration, so long as the exceed convention is enforced between Japan and Russia, and two, arbitration under the exceed additional facility rules, and three, unilateral arbitration. And uh, while Japan has ratified the exceed convention, Russia has not. As a result, Japanese investors have to choose the second and third option. And once again, uh, national security exception. And the protocol, okay, protocol of the Japan Russian BIT stipulates a security exception under Article 5, Paragraph 1. I quote, notwithstanding the provision of uh, paragraph 2, Article 3 of the agreement, so referring national treatment clause, each contracting party shall reserve the right to determine economic fields and areas of activities where activities of foreign investors shall be ex excluded or restricted in accordance with its applicable laws and regulations in case it is really necessary for the reason of national security. Okay, I'm going to summarize the essence. And this clause provokes the following issues. First, the scope of this article is limited to the national treatment clause. Thus, it does not justify a breach of any other articles of the BIT. Second, it will be discussed whether it was really necessary for the reason of national security for Russia to prevent foreign investors from withdrawing from Russia. This is 
an issue about applicability of the criteria. Okay? And third, for triggering the national security exception, the clause, as we already saw, Russia has to de determine new economic fields and areas of activities and then shall notify Japan of such fields and areas according to Article 5, Article 5 uh, and uh, Paragraph 3. Sorry, I omitted the citation here. Japan may argue that uh, such notification has never been done. Russia cannot rely on the exceptional clause. Then the last question about execution of arbitral award. Even if Japanese investors obtained an arbitral award in favor of them, in favor of Japanese investors, they will face the most difficult issue of its enforcement and execution. Okay? First of all, BIT, Japan-Russia BIT, provides in Article 11, Paragraph 3, that the decision of arbitration shall be final and binding upon both uh, parties to the disputes, which means Japanese investors and Russia, right? both parties to the dispute. This decision shall be executed by the applicable laws and regulations concerning the execution of decision in force in the country in whose territory such execution is sought. So it is clear that Russia, the contracting parties of the BIT, is obliged to execute all of the arbitral hours, whatever their content. Second, however, this obligation is subject to the applicable laws and regulations of Russia. Okay. It must be noted in this regard that Russia by Federal Law Number 171FZ of 8th June 2020, Russia amended the Commercial Procedure Law to the effect that the Russian Commercial Court possesses exclusive jurisdiction on disputes arising from anti-Russia sanctions and that any award of foreign countries and arbitral award and judgment of foreign, foreign courts cannot be executed in Russia. Okay? It's, a, it's a kind of block legislation. Still, there will be a room for Japanese investors to argue that investor state arbitral awards are exempt from the application of that regime since they are irrelevant to anti Russian sanctions. This can be a discussion. And third, uh, if Japanese investors cannot obtain any decision to execute the arbitral award in Russia, of course it's quite difficult, they will have to ask it in third countries. Uh, the 1958 New York Convention entitles Japanese investors to request the enforcement of arbitral awards subject to the public policy exception Article 5.1b, this is the basic position of new convention. And then, so a detailed explanation about execution, because it's a very, very important aspect of arbitral dispute. And then, and fourth, the final issue is state immunity. The New York Convention obliges states to execute arbitral awards in accordance with the rules of procedure of the territory where the award is relied upon in accord, uh, according to Article 3 of the New York Convention. Right? The said rules of procedure here, New York, New York Convention, normally includes the customary international law rules of immunity as broadly codified in the UN Immunity Convention. Uh, official name is United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property, adopted in 2004, but not yet entered into force. So this is why we have to discuss the customary international law rule of immunity, okay? re re reflected in the UN Convention. So with regard to the immunity of state property in a third country, for example, please imagine okay, between uh, 
before arbitration, Japanese investor against Russia. The Japanese investor won the case. The arbitral tribunal said, okay, Russia has to pay some amount of uh, compensation to investors. And Japanese investors now, for the moment, is now asking the execution of uh, arbitral hours in third countries, for example, United States, Switzerland, Canada, etc., etc. And in this case, we are now discussing the application of New York Convention and in relation to immunity. And Article 19, Paragraph C of the Convention provides that, I quote, uh, no uh, post-judgment measures, uh, measures of constraint, such as attachment, arrest, or execution against property of a state may be taken in connection with the proceedings before a court of another state, unless and except to the extent that it has been established that the property is essentially in use or intended for use by the state for other than government non-commercial purposes. Okay. This is the main point of discussion. And is in the territory of the state of the forum, provided that blah, blah, blah. I, I can omit the last part. So if Japanese investors could obtain a judgment in a third country to execute certain property of Russia and find in that country any Russian property which does not have government non-commercial purposes, there will be room for them to realize the execution of arbitral hours. Probably you can understand how difficult it is to find non-governmental properties of Russia in third countries. This is the last hurdle to be overcome. And in addition to that, I omitted a very important article, Article 21, Paragraph 1 and C, according to which property of the central bank shall not, shall not be considered as not governmental. Okay? Central bank asset must be regarded as having purposes of public, governmental purpose. Right? So we cannot touch upon the central bank asset. As you, as you might know, many countries have frozen the asset of Central Bank of Russia, but we cannot touch upon that asset in the context of execution, right? according to the UN Convention. It's a very complicated situation. Later on, we are going to discuss that point. Again, and, for, uh, and Section 4, foreign investors versus Ukraine. It's a quite controversial issue, but already we have to start the discussion of this kind of dispute. Since the invasion of Russia, the Ukrainian government has seized the Russian asset in its territory, causing damage to Russian investors and third country investors who possibly raised claims against Ukraine on the basis of each applicable VAT. On 11 May 2022, Ukrainian President Mr. Zelensky issued Presidential Order Number 326 for allowing the seizure of assets of Russian banks in Ukraine. Bank, Ukrainian, uh, no, sorry, sorry, Russian banks' assets were uh, so seized by Ukraine. And on 12 May 2023, sorry, Ukrainian Parliament approved that order. By this law, Shares of the subsidiary of Zubel Bank, the biggest uh, bank in the, of uh, Russia, and uh, sorry, I, I cannot <laughs> pronounce that uh, bank's name correctly. B B E B B E B B, the two banks of Russia were seized. Against this measure, uh, these two banks expressed their intention to submit a dispute to arbitra arbitration against Ukraine in accordance with the Russia-Ukraine BIT by alleging an unlawful expropriation. Okay. So the situation is, is, uh, is uh, uh, changed. And in addition to apparently Russian investors, there will be a third country investors who may initiate an investor state arbitration against Ukraine because the latter's measure of seizure extends to the assets indirectly related to Russia. Its scope is very, very broad. In fact, AMIC Energy, an Austrian company, is reported to submit a case before the arbitration on the grounds that 
the Ukrainian government, in this case, the Bureau of Economic, Economic Security of Ukraine, ESBU, started to seize assets of AMIC energy in Ukraine merely because it is connected to the Russian Federation. The agreement will rely on the Austria Ukraine PIT, ECT, and Exit Convention. Okay. <clears throat> And last part, section five, Russian investors versus Western states. So as a sanction normally takes a form of asset freezing or seizure of assets, it inevitably provokes investment disputes in both state to state and investor state. So firstly, beyond the context of the war in Ukraine, okay, beyond the context of just now we are discussing, so beyond the war in Ukraine, the Iranian asset case before the ICJ arose from the asset freezing measures of the United States against Iran. So as an investor state case, the Central Bank of Iran initiated an arbitral procedure against South Korea, okay, which has frozen the asset of the four, uh, 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 sorry, sorry, uh, assets of the Central Bank of Iran, amounting to seven billion US dollars, in accordance with U.S. sanctions law, the situation is a little bit complicated because of the United States domestic law, Korean government was requ required to freeze the assets of Iranian central bank. Right? This, this was the situation. But just recently, this is ongoing dispute. Just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, according to Korean media on 10th August 2023, sorry, I, om I omitted the reference on the slide. Uh, according to the Korean media, the United States and Iran reached an agreement to release the assets, so frozen by the Korean banks, to Iran under several conditions. So this piece has probably already disappeared. Between, so on the basis of agreement between the United States and Iran, and because of the approval of the United States, the Korean government said, yes, okay, we can release the frozen asset to Iran. Okay, this is the case. But, but before that, there was a dispute to be, uh, to be filed to the arbitral tribunal. Okay, in the context of the war in Ukraine, Western countries have broadly imposed sanctions against Russia and its nationals which provoke investment disputes. For example, first one, Lofneftchi versus Germany, because German, um, so this dispute will arise from Germany's, Germany's decision as a sanction against Russia to place Lofneftchi's two German subsidiaries under trusteeship. This is the first case reported. I'm not sure whether it is already an uh, arbitral tribunal to be composed. Second one, Volga Donepro Cargo Airlines, Russian Airlines versus Canada, which has arisen from Canada's decision to seize uh, the airplane of the Russian Airlines company to be submitted to the arbitration. And third one, Russian investors versus Belgium and Luxembourg, which will be lodged under the Belgium, Luxembourg, Russia, BIT. It is strange because trilateral parties, but we call it BIT. Uh, arising from the measure to freeze the assets held by uh, the European Central Securities Depositories, uh, uh, namely Clearstream clear and Euroclear. So many other cases will be submitted to investor state arbitration against Western states' measures of sanction in relation to the invasion of Russia. As we shall see below, Japan will not be an exception. Okay, since 26 uh, February 2022, the Japanese government has implemented economic sanctions against Russia, and thereafter, uh, Belarus was added, and which are divided into three categories. One, asset freeze measures, two, prohibition on export to specific entities of Russia, and three, uh, prohibition, prohibition on exports to Russia of items which could contribute to the, in, in the enhancement of Russian industrial capacities. And the first measures, called financial sanctions, are composed of two measures. One, the restriction on payment 
and two, the restriction on capital transactions. This is the framework. In the latter, so namely restriction on capital transactions, a permission system will be applied to capital transactions, uh, i.e. contract of deposit, trust, and money loan with individuals and entities designated by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs not notice. So this is called asset freeze, having the effect of prohibiting the transfer of assets owned by Russian individuals and entities in Japanese bank accounts. And as of the date of the latest list published on 28th February 2023 this year, uh, the target of the asset freeze measures in total amounts to 683 individuals, 129 groups, and 12 specific banks okay, in total. It widely includes banks, financial companies, and military companies, and expands not only to public people, but also to civilians. The most effective measure was against the Central Bank of Russia which was included in the list of sanctions on 1st March 2022. Due to this measure, Russia's central bank has been barred from transferring its foreign exchange reserves in Japanese banks to any other financial organs. So according to Nikkei newspaper, the freezing, frozen Russia's foreign exchange reserves amounts to 27 to 34 billion US dollars. Okay, a huge amount of money was frozen. So, <clears throat> the Japanese government's measures may provoke investment disputes under the Japan Russia BIT, which will contain the following topics of discussion. First, under the BIT, the term investors means uh, physical persons, namely nationals of Japan and citizens of Russia, under Article 14A. Then the most controversial issue will be whether the Central Bank of Russia can be regarded as, regarded as an investor, which includes company, okay, under Article 14B, seemingly corresponding to a juridical person. So under the Japan-Russia BIT, the term company, so regarded as investor, is broadly defined as, I quote, corporations, partnerships, companies, and associations, whether or not with limited liability, whether or not with legal personality, and whether or not for pecuniary profit, under Article 1, Paragraph 3. So in this regard, it is not crystal clear whether the Central Bank of Russia constitutes a company under this article. Right? This third point. And there are two approaches. On the one hand, if a tribunal adopts a Brohes test, that's a specific term, Brohes test, which has been used by tribunals for focusing on the nature of the act in question, namely the possession of assets in foreign banks, the Central Bank of Russia may be characterized as a company under BIT. On the other hand, if the tribunal adopts the approach taken by the ICJ, in the recent case of Iranian Assets case, 2023, which focused on the sovereign function of the act in question taken by a central bank, in this case, Central Bank of Iran. Uh, this, uh, how can I say it? Uh, it's okay. Uh, central Bank of Russia may not be characterized as a company under the BIT. Okay, two approaches. So I have to omit because of time, and uh, if necessary, I'm going to go back to this uh, discussion. Right? Center, uh, certain Iranian assets cases, it's a very interesting case to discuss the matter uh, before us. Okay, second, uh, uh, Article 1, Paragraph 1 of the BIT broadly uh, defines the term investment as every kind of asset. There is no doubt that the investment includes a variety of assets of Russian investors, which have been frozen by the Japanese government, including that of the Central Bank of Japan, Russia. And third, the asset freeze measures of the Japanese government do not necessarily amount to direct expropriation, but from its effect 
of impairing the use and enjoyment of the property may constitute indirect expropriation, which, without any compensation, can be unlawful expropriation under Article 5, Paragraph 1. And first, as the measures in question intentionally target only Russian in individuals and entities, they provoke problems relating to national treatment and uh, MFN treatment. So it is just necessary for the Japanese government to prepare for the investment dispute to be possibly raised by Russian investors in the future. Okay, uh, section six <coughs> about conclusion. A variety of investment disputes have arisen or may possibly arise from Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the formerly the annexation of Crimea. Based on the analysis in this lecture, the following points can be noted. First, uh, investment disputes between Ukrainian investors and the Russian Federation have been submitted to arbitration, and similar cases are expected to arise in the near future. It is undeniable that investment arbitration itself has no power to stop the ongoing aggression by Russia. Nevertheless, it can be expected that it contributes to weakening the legal position of Russia in many cases against Russia. Since it is quite difficult to expect a comprehensive solution to the central issue relating to territorial integrity and the use of force by way of international state-to-state -state litigation, such as ICJ, etc., 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 et 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 so steady efforts must be made through a series of investment arbitration. And second, uh, although Russia was initially absent from the Crimean investment cases, it has begun to express its commitment to arbitration. Thus, investment arbitration can function to express its commitment, uh, sorry, sorry, function as a place for Russia to present its legal views. It is necessary to keep a close watch on how Russia will show its attitude and reaction to investment arbitration in future cases. And third, uh, relationship between international investment law and the law of armed conflict can be an issue within and with beyond uh, investment arbitration. In general, BITs do not contain any, secu uh, any uh, security exceptions, or even, they do, uh, even when they do, its content remains unclear. So consequently, it must be understood that BITs apply even in conflict of armed conflict, sorry, and even in armed conflict situation. But however, there is a significant discrepancy between international investment law and the law of armed conflict, because investment arbitra uh, investment uh, sorry, sorry, international investment law contains a high level of investment protection based on the compensation level, compensation requirement. And on the other hand, the law of armed conflict allows incidental damage to civilian properties insofar as it is proportionate to military target. Unfortunately, the ideas of two areas of law are completely different. And of course, as a sanction against Russia, the Japanese government has imposed a ban on onward investment to Russia. Very, very exceptional case. Onward investment was uh, banned in a similar way to that of the United Kingdom. As this prohibition is prior to the establishment of investment, no problem uh, may arise from the BIT, in my impression. Okay, thank you very much. This is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much.